So this is not about uh, local infrastructure at all. Um, they asked me to uh, come and talk about some of our research on performance issues um, that, that we've done over the past, past few years. Um, and so I have sort of a variety of different results um, from a variety of different perspectives and, uh, and vantage points. Um, <clears throat> this, is, uh, this is something, you know, I, probably most people have seen. Um, sort of how we organize networks. This is the layering model of networks. This is how we organize networks, okay? Um, and it, it works in theory and also in practice. This is, this is where we talk about, uh, you know, layer two. Mike was talking about layer two before. There's, there's layer two, data link layer. Um, and I'm sort of struck when I think about performance, and I've, I've sort of heard it all day today. We actually talk about performance um, in terms of layer one, right? So the, the double E's give us these really big, fast pipes. Um, gigabit, 10 gigabit, whatever. Um, <clears throat> and, and that's great, that's a great foundation. Um, but, you know, this is sort of where I care about performance and probably where most people care about performance. Up here where, you know, sort of, we're trying to get something done, okay, at an application. Um, and so I like analogies. So if, if we think about this for a minute, um, you know, sort of at the bottom here, we have a really big, fast highway, all right? And on top of that, um, we have less fast things. So uh, we have potholes in the highway. And it turns out that we don't all drive Maseratis, OK? Um, so we have problems. We get these really fast foundations and then we sort of have problems as we go up and get to where we really sort of care about things at the application there. And where we run into problems sort of depends on, on the situation. So there's just a, a few slides here of examples. Um, if we think about a wireless network for a minute, um, we think about RF issues at the data link layer or buffering issues at the network layer um, on top of our fast foundation. Um, if we think about a residential network, usually we can sort of work out the physical and data link issues, but um, we may run into some buffering issues, the network layer. Um, within enterprise networks, often we can engineer our way to good sort of layer one, two, three um, performance, but then we hit um, the, the protocol performance in the transport and application layers. Um, when we start plugging in just sort of commodity boxes. Um, sort of the same picture in, in data centers. Um, oftentimes in data centers we can actually control the applications more than we can in a, in a sort of uh, more generic enterprise environment. And so um, our uh, horse and buggy is only at the uh, transport layer here. And, and we can have sort of these highly specialized networks where we control everything up and down this stack, okay? Um, but this sort of comes at a cost to us, right? Now we have to do things a particular way and we can't uh, use necessarily all the applications we want to use or, or do exactly what we're used to, so. Um, so now, um, we gave a talk last week in New York, um, not this talk, a talk, and I'm a measurement guy and I like plots, I'm a plot junkie. I gave a talk last week, I think there were 70 slides in the talk or something, and I think I showed one plot, and I made it up. Um, and so I think you guys are about to pay the price because I have a lot of plots this week. Um, this is sort of the first one, it's just sort of a, 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 sort of a high order plot, it comes from, um, some data we took uh, several years ago in, in inside Lawrence Berkeley Labs um, network. And this shows performance down here on, on the x-axis. And this is performance per connection we see in the network. And um, it's, a, it's a CDF on the y-axis. So let me just show you a couple points on here. Um, the, the line sort of, so the line on the left, all the way to the left here, this is um, all the connections that go between subnets, 
not within a subnet, but between subnets across the network. So these connections go through a router. Um, so if you, if you look up here, there's a point we can pick at. Only less than 10% of the traffic achieves even one megabit per second, which is pretty lousy. Uh, we've been hearing about one gigabit per second, right? It's a thousand times that. And that's only 10% of the connections. Okay, so then the line on the right here is all the connections that stay within a particular subnet. And that's better because it's to the right. It's better. It's, we're seeing better performance there. Um, and in fact, what you see here is that 10% of the connections are actually bounded by 10 megabit per second. Um, what that means is we found some corners of the network that are still running at 10 megabits per second. Most of this network at this time was a 100 meg network. Um, but we found some corners that were actually maxing out the, uh, some legacy bandwidth. Um, but sort of the high order bit up here is that, you know, performance is topping out in this network around 20 to 30 megabits per second. Okay, that's pretty cruddy when we're hearing about gigabyte networks, gigabit networks. Um, so I go back to my picture here, and what I want to do, you know, sort of that was a little bit of background, but what I want to do is sort of step through some of our work at these different layers. And I'm only going to concentrate on the upper three layers. Um, my advisor would call those the computer science laser, layers, and I'm a computer scientist. And uh, so the bottom two layers are, are done by people who are smarter than me. So um, let's start at the network layer here. Network layer is just sort of fundamentally about moving packets from one host to another host across some network. It's about routing. Um, so, it, it sort of at first blush, you're like, well, it shouldn't have much to do with performance. But there is sort of one place where it naturally affects performance. Um, this picture of a router here with a gigabit per second interface and a 100 megabit per second interface. And the problem happens when we're receiving it a gigabit and trying to send it 100 megabit. Obviously, that doesn't work. Um, so if, you, if that's persistent, obviously we're going to throw that router, going to throw a lot of stuff away. Yeah. Now, if it's just sort of bursty, and networks, networks are bursty, if it's just sort of bursty, we can fix this with a queue. Okay. That's the, the picture here. We, we sort of pick up a, a, a packet, we sort of put it in our pocket for a while, and then when the, when the link here on the right is ready, we can put it down. Okay. Um, that adds delay to the process. We'll see that. Um, when you build a queue, you build delay into the network, okay? And it's this delay that some people think is a big problem. Um, who's heard of buffer bloat? Anybody? Nobody's heard of buffer bloat? Oh, yeah, my student. Um, so there's this claim that um, buffers are way too big in the internet and that it's causing lots of problems because it's allowing us to build up a lot of delay in the network. And a, a guy named Jim Geddes, he um, is sort of the most vocal proponent of this and says this is one of the internet's most daunting problems is that we have this over buffering. And so uh, some of my colleagues at ICSI um, run the Netalyzer project, which is a, a pretty cool project. Uh, runs diagnostics on your, your internet connection. And so every little dot on here is a diagnostic test they ran. And one of the things they try to do is figure out how much uplink bandwidth you have. And that's um, the y-axis here. And they also try to infer how much uh, buffering you have at, at, at your uplink. And that's the x-axis. So this is a scatter plot. And then they drew some nice lines on here. And this one all the way over on the left is half a second over here. And all the points sort of underneath that and, and below it um, are cases where the buffering is such that you could build a half a second delay. And the next line is one second and then two seconds and then four seconds. And you can see that even the four second line, there's lots of, lots of tests where they've run these and found four seconds of buffering in the network. Um, this looks dire. Um, but the Netalyzer guys, they worked really hard to build these queues. And um, I work at home in my basement. 
the end of some cruddy residential network. And I uh, feel like I don't see these kinds of delays much. I SSH a lot into remote machines, and I don't feel like I see much of this delay. And so um, I decided to do a little bit of a study to figure out how much this potential actually happens. And the answer is it doesn't happen that much. Right? So I looked at, um, this is data from the case connection zone across the street, the uh, fiber to the home network, gigabit per second bidirectional to all the residents over here on, on Hessler. And um, what I measured was the remote end of their connection. So not the, not the side over here, but the 120,000 peers around the network that they talked to. And I measured the amount of bloat at those endpoints, those remote endpoints. And that's what I've plotted here on the x-axis is the amount of extra delay in the network. So for every round trip time, I observe, I subtract off the sort of minimum round trip time to that particular host. So this is the amount of extra delay in the network. This is the, this is the median point. And what we see here is that sort of at most we're adding maybe tens of milliseconds um, of bloat at, at, the, uh, at the median point. If you go up here, you find that 94% um, of the bloat is less than a quarter second. A quarter second, m for some applications, may still be important. Um, but it's not seconds. It's not quite as dire as the uh, buffer bloat folks would have you believe. So, um, so from there, we can move on to the transport layer for a minute. Um, I'm going to talk about TCP because TCP is the most widely used transport protocol by far in every measurement study I've ever seen, every kind of network. Um, TCP imposes two different kinds of control on traffic. And this is really where the performance starts to tank. Um, TCP uses flow control. And this is the way for um, the receiver of the data to tell the sender, don't send faster than I can handle. Okay. And then congestion control is about protecting the network, right? sharing the, the shared resource. Okay. And these both provide fundamental limits on performance. And they do it with uh, sliding windows. I'm uh, not much of a math guy, but I can understand this. Um, this is a fundamental property of sliding window protocol and TCP is that. Um, the throughput is equal to some window size, whatever the sliding window we're using, divided by the round trip time. Okay. So if you look at TCP, this is TCP's header. Don't worry about it. I just want to show you one thing on it. Don't, don't try to study it. Um, I want to show you the window size. So there's a, a place where TCP endpoints tell the other end of the connection, here's the amount of data you should send me. And then you should stop until I tell you to send some more. Okay. Originally, that was a 16-bit number. Uh, we've expanded it. Now we can put a gigabyte of advertised window into TCP. <coughs> okay, so that sounds pretty good. Um, if, you, if you look how this sort of equation plays out, throughput equals window over round trip time, um, you can just sort of fill in some different values and, and play with it for a minute. And what I want to say is that if you think about windows of about a megabyte, that's sort of roughly okay. All right? That's sort of where we want to be. Okay? A megabyte at a, at a millisecond round trip time, which is a very local, round trip, uh, a very local network, will give you throughput of 7.8 gigabits per second. Okay? So that's a good you know, 10 gigabit network or something like that. Um, and, and you know, as you go up, you see um, that a megabyte is, you know, sort of approximating what we might have down at layer one, the, the raw capacity would get us there. Maybe a little more than a megabyte, maybe a little less, but somewhere around there. Um, just for fun, I drew up some other things here. The one gigabyte window, that's the maximum window. Uh, local network delay of maybe a millisecond, maybe a little less, give us eight terabits per second. Um, Last line on there is for fun. I used to work at NASA and uh, played with their satellite networks with a geosynchronous satellite hop in there, half a second hop. That's a slow network. Um, all right, so 
Let's look at flow control for a minute. I looked at some data again from uh, across the street, the case connection zone. And um, sort of this is split into incoming and outgoing data, but um, this is the window size we see in the traffic, the maximum window size in a connection divided by the round trip time of that connection. And so this is the, in theory, the maximum throughput we can get out of um, that connection. So let's look at a couple points here. Again, we see that only 10% of the incoming connections can achieve more than 100 megabits per second. 100 megabits per second might sound fast, right? But that's 10% of the bandwidth that those houses are connected with. All wired up with, uh, or fibered up with a gigabit per second. Um, and you see for, for uh, the outgoing connections, it's even worse. Okay, only a very few can achieve even 100 megabits per second. All right, so that's not good. We need to we need to work on this. The second um, limit that TCP imposes is for congestion control. So flow control is about not overwhelming the receiver. Congestion control is about not overwhelming the network, and. For congestion control, we sort of use this sliding, another sliding window, which is always less than the advertised window. Um, but this one changes sort of as we perceive the network changing. As more available bandwidth becomes available or more contention for that bandwidth, we, we sort of drop back. And so this is sort of the congestion window across time. And I want to show you two bits of this. Um, this is how we start. We start with something called slow start. We start with some initial window. I've used four here. It, actually, recently we've allowed connections to use up to 10 packets as their initial window, but I've used four on this example. And then, sort of after that, we double the window every round trip time. Okay, so we go from four to eight to 16 to 32 here. And in this example, at 32, we drop a packet. And we take that to mean there's contention. We've fallen off the top of a queue. Remember the router queue? It filled up. So the incoming packets can't be, we can't deal with them anymore. So we throw them on the floor, drop a packet. TCP notices this and says, ah, well, now there must be contention for the bandwidth. And so it drops the congestion window down. And it drops it by half, multiplicative decrease. Okay. So there's an observation from this initial part of a, of a connection. And that is that it takes data to build up speed. Okay. And in fact, it takes, to, to get to a window of about x bytes, it takes 2x bytes of data. And remember, we want to get to a window of somewhere around a megabyte to you know, really be humming along. So that would suggest that it takes two megabytes of data to get there. Two megabytes might not sound like a lot. I went off and looked at how big connections were. I've done this any number of times. This is just my favorite example because it's so pretty. Um, this is connection sizes um, at Lawrence Berkeley Labs um, a few years ago. Every plot I've ever drawn sort of looks like this. They're always heavy tailed like this. This is a log scale on the x-axis of connection sizes, CCDF on the, on the right. So if we just think about this set of connections up here, right there, that's 99% of the connections. 99% of the connections are less than two or 300K, if you look down here at the x-axis. Right. Remember I said we needed a, about two megabytes of data to get a one megabyte window. Well, here are the set of connections that send at least two megabytes of data. And that's much less than 1% of the connections. It's not really a, a good story for sort of general use of a lot of bandwidth. Um, so OK, another thing we looked at was said, well, let's take the connections without loss from the case connection zone again. Um, since there's no loss, we don't think there's any congestion in the network. So they should be just ramping up and going fast. And what we looked at was we looked at um, 
the maximum congestion window we saw. And that's what this is. This is the distribution of the maximum congestion window we see. And it's, uh, you know, the, the right side of this over here is, is like 128K or something. It's very small to begin with. But what we really noticed when we, when we plotted this was we noticed there's a lot of modes in here. And all these modes are some limit that the sender has put on this connection. Okay? A sender side limit at 16K, 32K, 64, 96, 128K. Okay? That's a limit on the size of the sliding window. Well, even 128K is a pretty small limit when we need a window of, of a megabyte, right? Um, so, sort of, if we think about this for a minute, we, find, we do find that 12% of the connections are limited by the receiver, but then we find 45% are in one of those modes that I just showed you. So 45% are constrained by, by the sender. These are host limits. You know, we built this fast highway and now the host won't use it, okay? Um, you know, we're getting close to 60% of the connections here. All right, so I want to go back to this picture one more time, and I want to talk about the steady state behavior of TCP for a minute. Um, here, when we don't see congestion, when we don't see loss, what we do is we build the congestion window sort of linearly to try to probe the network for more capacity. We want to use more capacity if it's there. Okay? And we just keep doing that until we actually see congestion. There's no capacity there. We just keep building until then. At that point, we do the multiplicative decrease again. And we cut the window in half. So if you were to sort of look at it, the average sending rate is somewhere right there down the middle. That makes sense, right? And in fact, there's actually this model of TCP performance. Um, and there's a big equation that's far too much math for me. Um, but it boils down to this. So the, the throughput that we get is in proportion to the segment size divided by the round trip time times the square root of the loss rate. So in other words, your performance is indirectly proportional to the round trip time. Your performance is indirectly proportional to the loss rate, you see. So we use this model and we, we looked at all the connections. Um, we see in, in the case connection zone where we actually do see loss. We see some, some amount of um, congestion in the network. And we compared the performance we observe with this model. And that's what this is, the ratio of the model to what we actually observe. I just want to show you one point here, the median point. 50% of the connections we see should be going 10 times faster than they are. Okay. And if you think, well, these things are probably going pretty fast anyway, they're not. Um, here is uh, uh, two plots, one without loss, one with loss, of the performance we see over in the CCZ. This is the amount of data sent along the x-axis, and then the performance along the y-axis. I think my, oh, you did, my, there is an axis label on the y-axis there. It's uh, throughput in megabits per second, okay? You can't see it because uh, the projector has chopped off my label. The two lines are at 1 and 10 megabits. You see, we see very few points above 10 megabits per second here. Okay. And that sort of brings us to the application layer, and I don't want to talk about the application layer too much. Um, we, don't, we haven't done a whole lot of performance uh, study at the application layer, but I do want to show you one thing that, that we did um, a year or two ago. We looked at application sending patterns. These things matter. Um, and in particular, um, I want to highlight one here. These are sort of three sample connections, and we sort of divide them up into phases. Right? And, and the phase is sort of N there means nobody is sending. L means that the local host is sending. R means the remote host is sending. And B means both hosts are sending. And if you look, this is sort of time going across here. And if you look at the last example there, there's an end period right in the middle. That's a, that's a point in time where the application has just totally stepped back and is not trying to transmit anything. Okay. 
and that's going to hurt our performance. Okay, if applications sort of are, you know, just a little bit chatty, and then they stop for a while, and then they're just a little bit chatty. It's much better if they can try to do a whole lot of work um, at once. And so I just want to show you two things. We've found a lot of things about this, but two things we find is that um, we have one of these internal silent periods, like the, the last, like that last connection there. Um, in 28% of the connections that we see at, at my institute, and 37% of the CCZ connections. So this happens a bunch. The application is sending and working in a way that is um, not its most advantageous for performance benefit. And so that's sort of what I have. Um, go back to this, that you know, it's not just about layer one. That's necessary. We have to build that. We have to make networks go fast, okay? But we have to pay attention to a lot of stuff on top of that as well. Um, that's, that's sort of what our, our results show. And um, so a lot of this work that I've shown you, a lot of these plots um, come from Matt Sargent, who's back here. Uh, he's an EECS PhD student. He's almost done. He'll be out of here in a couple months. Um, and so he can probably answer these questions better than I can, or uh, give you more details about these things. But that's sort of all I have here. So. Oh, there are references here. Uh, uh, whatever we've put out about all this, um, you can go find. So.